about to get an inside look at one of London's greatest rhythm sections, Richard Spaven on the drums and Rob Malarkey on the bass. Scott and I sit down with these legends as they demonstrate three tunes and break down exactly what they're doing. We talk about drum and bass, Jay Dilla grooves playing behind the beat, what a drummer is actually looking for from a bass player, and Rob's amazing pedal board and sounds. And make sure to watch to the end of the video to see if this incredible rhythm section sticks together or falls apart in our infamous string change challenge. If you enjoy this type of content, please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel so we can bring you more of it. Let's get into it. <laughs> oh my god i have so many questions first of all it's so fun to see this up close you know like i've never been this close to this kind of music or like um a rhythm section playing drum and bass yeah no i've never been like three feet away and so many things struck me as I was like seeing the interaction this close. And the first thing that struck me and what I'd love to ask you about is it seems like there's this almost role reversal in this dynamic where, whereas like in funk music, maybe a bass is doing a repeated ostinato, yeah. holding it down to a certain degree, right? But in this, you're the ostinato, right? You're playing patterns yeah. that are all completely locked in there's this evenness and syncopation evenness even in velocity right or in jazz actually is maybe even a better example isn't it you yes playing bass players literally holding it down right the rule is that you play four beats to the bar and then the drummer's like dropping the bombs and yes in the crazy stuff yeah you're right it's a reversal on that yeah yeah good point and it frees you up then to be in melody zone mm. right yeah like i mean you're doubling that melody Yep. Then you're also playing in that end piece, you're improvising with effects, right? You're turning on a synth pedal. Mm -hmm. I'd love to talk about this whammy thing that you're doing, <laughs> but you're not playing the repeated pattern. Right. Right? Yeah, or I'm playing around a repeat, but yeah, I see what you mean. That's the, that's the beat and that's the repeat thing. But yeah, I'm playing around that. I mean, I always have this, I have a philosophy that this is a melody instrument mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're usually playing one note at a time, but sometimes the melody's at the bottom. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I just, yeah. think, I just think, I try and think melodically all the time. So I try and hear ahead what I'm going to play. You know, you have this kind of strange thing where you can imagine into the future what the melody is going to be that you're mm. saying. I'm really fascinated by this yeah. idea, actually. But um, yeah, and then you can just apply it to bass line. So, sorry, jump, probably jumping into some No, of no, I love here. that. What, are you like listening forward in your mind? Exactly, like, yeah. You're like uh, trying to imagine what you what yeah. it's going to sound like for the listener yeah. ahead of time. Yeah, I mean, I've put a lot of work into just sort of singing through my instrument, do you know what I mean? So I, I make the connection so that I can hear a thing and my fingers will do it. You know, that's like the big goal for me. Right, freedom. That, that I'm always working towards, yeah. like. If I can think of great melodies here, then I can hopefully recreate them on there. It doesn't sound like, for me, like I've listened to you a lot, right? And so I like obviously listen to you there, but I've just listened to you a lot, like over the years. And um, and I'm every time I, I listen to you, I'm like, huh, doesn't play any of the sort of like bass stuff that 
like so many of the players play. Like I listen to a, a, one guy and I'm like, oh yeah, well he plays that too, he plays that too. But when you play, it's like you have almost like a different approach to organizing, like to melody, to your point, to melody, but just it, it almost like, are you thinking about keys? I don't mean like, I mean like keys. Are you a keys oh, player? Right. Yeah, Do you I have think a... about keys as you're playing? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah I have a background of, yeah, I play a bit of piano. That's been really helpful for just like understanding harmony and and you know getting away from the scalic thing maybe is 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 what is the common thread. The people who play a fretboard yeah. very often they just played scales, you know, and you yeah. hear them playing consecutive like pentatonic adjacent, shapes, or, yeah, yeah. And yeah, so yeah. it's all just always adjacent notes, and I really tried to get away from that. But yeah, I guess not thinking so much about scales, but just yeah, what the harmony is and trying. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a secret. Well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are you thinking more sort of like chords? Yeah, trying to yeah. highlight the harmony. Yeah. And so they, not, and that's yeah. always more melodic as well because you get these big jumps. You know, you're jumping between the these chord tones. Yeah. And it's always going to sound a bit more like a melody. That a I'm melody. Yeah. yeah. In that situation, are you, are you, are you consciously? And maybe not now because you've been doing it for a long time, right? But have you consciously in the past thought, I don't want to sound like a bass in this scenario. I want to sound like something else. No, it's a, I think I respect my role as a bass player, you yeah. know. I, I'm trying to do everything. I'm trying to keep everyone happy. And yeah. I think that's a good thing about playing other instruments a little bit. You get, you get a better idea of what people want to hear, you know. Yeah. I've got a, Pretty good idea what Rich wants to hear. <laughs> what do you want? Yeah. <laughs> what do you want out of a bass player? Uh, like especially in this like yeah, yeah. drum and bass style. Like, like if you scenario. can speak to this scenario, what do you want? This is a good example because it, it could it can very easily be wrong. You know what I mean? Sure. If, if the bass player gets like gets involved with, you know, you get all the subdivisions basically as the yes. drummer in this, and that's where it comes from. Is like the you know the records the original cut up samples and everything drums is all subdivisions i mean bass a lot of the time is just languid legato Lent. just yeah and really that's about you know this is not normally the scenario sitting in armchairs when it's when <laughs> drum bass. it's not it's like, it should be it's like, you know like bass bins and just try like pleasing the audience in that way mm. like it's about the drop you know when yes. the sub comes it's yeah. like everyone just floats mm. in the air you know and you feel yes. it in your chest and it's Yes. That's a it's a club feeling, you know. If the bass player is going to get involved in all the subdivisions on something like this, then instantly the genre has gone down the toilet. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And you just have a load of fusion that's not going to make sense, like from in that setting, of, yeah. Yeah, from yeah. the influences that you're sort of, you know, that's because that's what I've come up on. It's like yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, you've got to think about the the culture of it and and, yeah. and where this music works. You know. Yeah. And there's an I mean, agreement between the two of you, right? You're trusting that that you are not going to dig into the syncopation too hard. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah, it's yeah. best. It just works best if I if I leave a lot of space on this kind of beat. If yeah. I yeah. leave some space, I mean, I probably could have left a bit more space. <laughs> no, man, no, it's only great. Uh, that, but, but you're also well. not like laying out where the one is either. You're not sort of like. Meh. No. Matt, you know actually, I mean? yeah, no. I was just thinking if we were playing this in a big, through a big system or something, I'd probably play a lot less, actually. Mm, right, so, got it. Yeah. I would love to ask you too, Rich, could you break down that beat, that main beat where you're crossing? The one where I'm going like this? Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> well, what I do, I just go like this. <laughs> <laughs> and it all just happens. I would love, like, if you could, if you would play that beat and if you could slow it down, could you? Yeah, it, I'll tell you where it came from, is just experimenting with like groups of three over the top of a four thing, so. Ah! And then just different, like weird placements of those. I love placing things in, deliberately in weird places. Yes. Because if you just play something, then you tend to place things like Phil's, you, you know, somebody, someone who's listening to you could say, you're doing that in the same place all the time. And you're like, oh, am I? I didn't know that. And I'd sort of hate to think that I might be doing that. Right. So I place things deliberately in places. Right, yeah. different know? places. So that's how this came about, because it just happens in a couple of different places. So it's, it's that slowed down, and then it's... It's basically that. And what 
makes you want to cross? Is it is it a sonic motivation? Uh, it's, it's probably physical more than sonic, I would say. Just because you're with this stuff, you're trying to just make it flow and make it sound contained. Yeah. And I think the easiest way that you can sort of like get that out, the better. Do you know what I mean? Rather than making it sort of convoluted and linear or something, whatever it is. Yeah. Then for this, yeah, it's just kind of like just trying to trying to smooth it over. And can you talk too about snare treatment? Um, would you play that once? So I see you've got a splash right on I've top got a of the snare. On here, yeah. Yeah. Will you play it? Will you give us an example of that groove without the splash, and then put the splash on and show us how much that contributes to the sound? Well, the only I only ever use this on the snare, so I'll give you an actual comparison. Cause yeah, otherwise great. It'll sound like total mess. It's. Uh, I mean, it, it just set, it just tightens it up. Yes. In effect, makes it sound like a bit of a smaller sort of. Okay, but do it without that. I want to hear like why, like the oh, motivation. What it sounds like. Like show us why, why this would be bad. Like if you don't have any treatment on the drum, why would, why are you treating the drum? Oh, know? well, I do, I just do all the time because it's just going to sound ringy and not, not i mean we're sort of playing in sort of like hip-hop and yes broken hit, beat hit it and yeah let yeah, me hear it see, let I'm, me hear I'm it like, i know you don't even want yeah, to it's yeah. amazing <laughs> go on yeah. come on do it oh, yeah. see it's terrible <laughs> can you play the groove with it though Actually, kind of good. Is that so, sonically <laughs> painful for you? It's just like, ah. No, it's okay. It wasn't as bad. That's what he sounds like a break. <laughs> right, but it, but motivated by like what, like eight oh eight snares, or or are you motivated? Well, drum and bass was all like aim and break snares, yeah. and then pitched up, right? So yes. you you take a live drummer, you sample the guy. I mean, uh, G C Coleman, aim and break. Yeah. So you sample the guy, then all the producers with samplers get hold of that break pitch it up by yeah. probably about three or four semitones something like that and then you've got like a quicker okay. it's going to be shorter yes yeah. so yeah. shorter higher pitch yes so that's and that's the reason for the treatment yeah yeah but if you put weight on a snare drummer you'll you brings a pitch up. bring the pitch up yeah, yeah. Mega. And what about you, Rob? What's your, Ooh. in terms of, I know, like there's a lot going on down here. I was wondering whether we should do it just in a wanna or, <laughs> <laughs> or w w whether we should continually, I think we should continually come back to the pedal board throughout this episode. Yeah. As wow. like, yeah. For, for Rich, obviously, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah but in that track there, well, like, what sounds were you using? You, you asked me to bring down my board and it, like, I don't really have a, a board as such. Pe people keep offering to like make mine all tidy because look, look at the state. <laughs> this, is, this is how I built my board. But this is my Jacob Collier board set and it was right. pretty much ready to go. So I just brought it down and it's really got some other things. It's designed to do some other stuff really right, that we're it. not really doing today. To be honest, I would have probably just brought the bass rig and the T16 Octava and I could do everything I need to today. So like amp sound, and then that sub yeah. sound in the pedal. What is yeah. the bass rig like a preamp and a, and a DI? Yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. It's, yeah, these just came out pretty recently and there's two additions uh, and this black panel one simulates a Fender bass man. Got it. But just it's totally analog. So right. Oh, got no it. No yeah, modeling yeah. in there, which I just find amazing. So I guess if you open it, it would just be like a city of, of capacitors. You know yeah, I mean? yeah. But I think I, I really love it. For me working on in ears a lot, uh, I needed something to like expand the harmonics and, yeah. and, and generate some tone in the way that a nice old valve amp does. I wouldn't say it sounds exactly like a bass one, but it actually does everything I need. And it's just like you make some careful tweaks with the drive yeah. and, the, and the blend and stuff. And it's spot on, I love it. Can you give us a sample of, you know, just bass in isolation, right? That main, maybe melody sound that you're playing and yeah. then maybe with the T16 octave and then also what you were doing with the wham <laughs> in that. I'm yeah. gonna get one of these. My life is gonna be cut. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I mean, gonna go full whammy. Yeah, <laughs> full whammy. That was kind of spontaneous, but I just always remember there's this. Can can we talk whammy for a second? Uh, we absolutely <laughs> can. So I need to tell you the story about this. Basically, my board looked pretty different on the Jacob uh, tour. 
uh, we did a big big old tour this year and yeah always swapping things out of course going into guitar stores around the world and and, and you spot something like yeah, okay yeah. i can use this i can build it in and then uh unfortunately i had to stay home for a couple of weeks just uh with some family problems basically and Believe it or not, I found a friend who could dep on the Jacob Collier gig. <laughs> Connor Chaplin, we're talking about. He's, he's a legend. Yes, uh, UK jazz. He like mostly does jazz stuff, but he stepped in. But on the gig, I play a Fender Six. It'd be nice if I could have brought it down, I guess. But uh, do you know the Fender Six? Bass Six. Yeah, the Bass yeah. Six. Yeah. yeah, dude. It's a guitar down an octave. Absolutely. So, yeah. so in effect, it's a short scale bass with a couple of guitar strings. You do the, you do the full gig on that, yeah. I do a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. probably four or five tunes. Um, and so there's a ton of guitar parts. Sometimes Jacob will play bass for the chorus and then I'll yeah. get, switch to guitar. That's and I'll, cool. and this, that's when this is, the HX is great because you just switch the presets, go to a guitar amp, you know, simulation. Connor doesn't really play guitar. <laughs> there's a ton of synth stuff and a ton of guitar parts and he's more of a bass player. The, like the emergency situation was Jacob just got his whammy pedal sent out. It was like, just write the, you know, I thought I'll just write out the guitar parts. Go up an octave. In bass clef. Stick that one. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Up an octave. Sure. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. Simon got through the gig. They had to do about five gigs without me, and he just did that. And, Wicked. And uh, when I came back, it was on the board. <laughs> I tied it up a bit and was just playing with it on the gig, just hitting a few things. And I found just some stuff on it that I really love. And one of them, I think this is like the most recent version of this, right? The DT. Uh, <laughs> You can set it to momentarily change the pitch, but um, my sort of angle on it was it sounds pretty cool if you just like. Oh. It almost sounds like an edit. Like a glitch, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you can and alter that up and down, right? So you yeah, can you do can it in semi tone and all it. that, yeah. And it sort of has a slide of time as well, which yeah. you can't edit oh, for some wow. reason, but. It, yeah, you can you can get quite creative with it. I love it. And do you uh, ever? And then there's this side, you know, which is yeah. I was going to say, do you ever do that? Yeah. Yeah, I try. My thing is how to not <laughs> try and be mono neon. Do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right. What can you do yeah. with it? So yeah, sometimes I'll do some big swoops with it. I guess it could be really great on some drum and bass stuff. Do you know what I mean? To get a full octave kind of or something. Right. Sure. But also like these settings where you, I quite like. Because it does really well at tracking more than one note at once. So, so you know, if I play play more than one note at a time and getting it to harmonise it, it, does some really beautiful stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. There's a lot of stuff. And could you take us through a little bit of this octave sound, you know, because yeah. Rich, you mentioned like when the sub drops in, right? And that's that moment where you're using the COG T16. Mm -hmm. Can you play that for us a little bit and talk to us about how you're yeah. thinking about octave pedal bass? Yeah. So basically, I mean, my pedal board for 20 years was basically an, an OC2 and a Moog a Moog low pass filter yeah and really I never found anything that sounds quite as good as that but it's a bit noisy and you know my stuff's getting old and these guys cog effects in Sheffield seem to fit both things <laughs> into something I can put in my pocket and it, and it does actually to me sounds a lot like the OC2 that funny kind of square wave fuzz on yes. the top yeah. but it's also got a filter built in and so you can just sweep it down until you oh. just got... Oh, so you can just get that. So that sounds good, right? <laughs> and immediately it's that vibe. Yeah, but that thing of, yeah, so only enable the octave down and play an octave up and you're just sort of synthesizing a sound, you know, effectively. Right. And it's, yeah, uh, yeah. it's kind of a, yeah, a bit of a distorted square wave sound, I guess I'd describe it, but it's, it's perfect, yeah. And what are the, what's the other, the other stuff on the board? There's like a compressor. Um, do you keep your compressor always on? I do actually for Jacob's thing. Again, it's like 
within ears you just need a bit of help sometimes being able to hear yourself all the time so it's mm. pretty subtle you'll see like my dry mix is is way up higher than the compressed mix so i'm just dialing a bit in and this actually it's a shame we didn't hook it up but this is a side chain opto compressor and what you can do is send i could just put a mic in the kick drum and plug it into there and it'll do the kind of Amazing. you know like duck the whole signal it's really good fun and I haven't seen a lot of hardware units that will do that, right. you know, that go on a pedal board. Is it, uh, it sounds great as well. So essentially building sort of almost like a modular synth rig. Yeah, right? I guess so, kind of, yeah. And then, of course, in the HX, you've got, like, infinite <laughs> yeah. amount of things to add into the loop. So actually, the way I have this set up is it's quite handy for me to be able to set up a sound um, while I'm playing. So I might want to get to a section on Jacob's gig where I kick in the octava and the sidechain compressor in one yes. go, but it's quite hard to do that with my foot. So I'll keep those two in the sidechain of the HX and I'll just have a preset. So that kicks in both of those things at once. Yes. And I can, then I can be playing set up another sound yes. for the next bit. And <laughs> so routing both those pedals into that yeah. effects loop on the side of the HX and exactly, then just yeah. using the HX as the controller. Yeah, just yeah. switches a bunch of pedals on and off. That's such a useful feature of, of the HX. Yeah, actually. very cool. Yeah. I love this thing, by the way. I, n I never thought I'd say that about a digital effects unit. Well, the HX Dom, the tech of the world, aren't they? It's, it's like, so, so many people use like, it. To release something that was so fully featured and fully realized and, and it works and you can use it as a toolkit. I used it the other day just to mix my bass synth and my bass guitar. No effects, but it's great. Like You can change yeah. whether the inputs are line level or whatever. It's amazing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, hold on right there, my beautiful bass players. I am interrupting this broadcast to tell you something awesome. But first of all, I just want to say a massive shout out to Rich Spaven and Rob Malaki for being so awesome. Smash that like button and give these guys some love. They really deserve it. Now, whilst I'm here, just a quick shout to let you know that I'm about to open the Slap Accelerator course for enrollment. We open it once a year and loads of people ask us what it's like, what are the lessons like and stuff like that. So I wanna give you free access today for one of the lessons, okay? And it's an awesome lesson. It's all about slap. We're talking about hammer-ons and pull-offs and articulations, how to get them into your grooves. And again, this lesson is directly from the Slap Accelerator. You would usually have to pay like 200 bucks to access this lesson. Today, we are gonna give you it for free, yay! So what I'll do is I'll make sure the URL is on the screen right here so you know where to go. And we will also put a link down below in the description so you can get it there as well. With that said, Here's back to Robin Rich.
<laughs> it's super stretchy, isn't it? It's like, if anybody hasn't heard anybody play like that before, they'd be like, where, where am I feeling it? Where's the one? It's just sort of like, it really feels ambiguous. And obviously that comes from like Jay, Jay Diller and that whole Detroit scene, right? Like, how did you guys get into playing like that? And then we can like go from there. I mean, for me, it was just, it was like hearing that music when I first heard it, I was just, I just reacted to it. You know, I was like, what is this? Like first question, you know, how do I even know that I like it so much? <laughs> yeah. Why is my neck moving like <laughs> this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? But I've realized later on in trying to learn this stuff that it's like, if it makes you move, then you probably kind of, essentially you understand it already. You know what I mean? If you it's can like, actually feel it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. imagine that vibe in the studio when they're making this stuff. It's like, that's the vibe. Uh, yes. And if that comes across when you're listening to it, then you're, you're kind of in, you know, so it was really that. And then I had a tour with some Detroit artists and I'd bought the records and, you know, I was so into the album. Then I got asked to tour with these guys, with Wajid and Platinum Pie Pipers. Yeah. So I was like, right, I now really need to learn this stuff, which... What's the first thing you did on the kit to try to get closer to that beat? To be honest, it's, this is a long time ago and it wasn't on the kit at all. Really? I got, I got a pillow and a stick and I played along to it just and was just playing the hi-hats so that I could visualize that I was playing the hi-hats on the record as opposed to hearing my own hi-hats conflicting with their hi-hats. Right. So it just became like a okay, I'm in, and then once you're in, you got to stay in, and then you got. <laughs> in to... terms of like the placement of where it is, yes, that hi -hat, yes. yeah, because it's that sort of flex bend to the feel of it. So it was then about sort of taking ownership of that, and then sort of onto the kit with it, and it's like, okay, I get it now. Yeah, you know. And you have talked before about how the quintuplet thing isn't the thing. There are people well, that break this down. I don't right? know, I don't know. Sharon, Sharon, <laughs> lift, li lift up your hoodie. <laughs> Real men play quintuplets. <laughs> and I think that Richard's got like a problem with this. <laughs> <laughs> and for context right? as well, for anybody watching. <laughs> yeah, that is the vibe, that's right? the vibe. <laughs> For anybody watching, there's been a lot of, you know, a lot of talk about quintuplets and how it can, I guess, be that feel can feel can be theorized into quintuplets. Is that a decent kind of like description of what happened? I think you can, because this there's there's optional amounts of swing that are available to mm. the way we're doing it. For me, it's just about like approaching it in the same way that the producers who made this music approached it, and that was not to sit down and talk about subdivisions because it, it's not just quintuplets it's just if you're coming from it from that like overly intellectual point of view which is fine you could still make music like that and it'll be interesting but if you're talking about Detroit hip-hop then it's like it's not about oh it's a you know 30 second triplet or a quintuplet or well, you're just not coming at it like that yeah it's just about feel and it's actually about something that you can't write down, you can't notate this. It, it doesn't work, you can't do it. And I think that's great. And yeah. you've called this wonky time, right? I saw, I saw on your Patreon where you, you, know, you guys do like a, a breakdown where you go straight, swung, yeah. and then there's something in between. And the notes even that you put up get blurry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? The notes actually yeah, yeah, get blurry, yeah. the image of the notes. Mm. Uh, we, would, we were playing like a straight beat, you know, just yes. like straight eights. Yes. And then we were playing like straight swing, can I yes, play like exactly. straight, straight, straight triplets. Yep. And then we were doing like the kind of in-between kind of... The thing is, you know, I guess or maybe most of us got us coming from an academic background, you right. know what I mean, and familiar with... Western notation and these, uh, these whole boundaries that that imposes on it. Oh, these is, there's your four beats. That's where they go. That one lands on this beat. Now yeah, you yeah. can divide yeah. them off into that. Yeah, I think people making beats on on NPCs weren't really coming. Of course, coming from there. It's yes. all you know. So it's just like, does this feel good? You know. And depending on where the sample is cut, right? Yeah. Depending on how things were yeah. <clears throat> were stitched together. Yeah, but also, I mean, just throughout the history of the world, people have been feeling bees differently, yes. you know, and, then, right. and they just interpret things and you try and write them down. It's interesting, yeah, I do, I do disagree with the, the quintuplet thing. There might be a few examples where it kind of fits in, but definitely I don't think that was ever the intention. Mm -hmm. And also, like, 
if you go back and listen through all those Diller instrumentals, every single one is completely different. He just approaches it differently. Yeah. Something's pushing, something's pulling, something, you know, yes, something's yes. Ir irregular, something's yeah. irregular. It just all helps contribute to this, to this thing, and it's not, it's not notatable. Yes. With that main bass line and that pattern that you're playing, mm. would you guys play three versions of it? What it would sound like if you played it like a funk, like a straight thing, a swung thing, and then what you just played? Could you do that? Or even, or even just straight yeah. Dilla. Yeah, let's just... We can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Straight, not straight. Good. Oh no, see it's swung. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't, I can't go back to... <laughs> can't do it. So straight, yeah. It's going to be really straight. Yeah, yeah. Trying to make it sound good as well, so we're not just being dicks about it. Yeah, no, no, no. I, right, of course. Well, and I mean, the straight thing, it's not bad. It's just a different thing. Yeah, totally different. Yeah, yeah exactly. of course. Yeah. We also got into, when because we did a whole Patreon, we laid it out with this. Because we're talking about this as like a sort of internal clock, you know, of just like understanding. But then also, it's like Rob says, like, producers like Dilla coming at each track in a different way. It also sounds ridiculous if like the drums are swinging and the bass is like super straight and it's actually like the offset which can be really interesting or the other way around straight drums swingy bass mm -hmm. or whatever or yeah. you know or early snares and all sorts of different yes. like connotations for this yeah. which really like stretches the drummer bass player relationship I think yeah because my question was going to be based on that actually because like let's say something like you take something straight you've got four beats in the bar right this is the drums this is the bass and you're like kind of matching up like this aren't you and, and like you know one of you might play a little behind one but it's kind of like everything's sort of like within the grid yeah so and that's an agreed it's a silent agreement hopefully that everything yeah. is on that grid right whereas when you are both of you are sort of like contorting the grid somewhat yeah that just in the nature of what you're doing is not going to line up yeah. there's always going to be flams yeah. right because what to, you're playing yeah it shouldn't line up yeah yeah it's, yeah. it's yeah. best if it doesn't yeah you're right like if, if you're coming from a whole you know if we like disco bands or something it'd always be like the kick and the bass they do the same thing yeah it's like they they add up to make this cool sound at the bottom you know and um i mean for, for me really it was uh, we have to talk about voodoo the just hearing D'Angelo's voodoo was really the defining moment for me. It, on that record, there's the whole range of like where you can put things, and yeah. it's such a such a great example. Yeah. When you're playing, do you ever feel like how far can you stretch it in terms of what we were just talking about? Like then, like obviously. Well, you can nearly end up back on the beat again because you can stretch it back so far. I mean, right. as an example of this of what you're talking about, right? If you take like um, some 16th notes and swing them, so... And then you swing that. So... So those 16ths on the kick are getting pushed further and further back, so you can just keep... Yeah. Oh, and then it back ends. And, you're, and you end up, you're nearly playing four, back on. four you know? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It's, it's, they can be a different... I don't know, but I don't know why when most drummers try and do that, it doesn't, it doesn't sound, sound like it doesn't that. Sound yeah. Like that. <laughs> well, and voodoo with voodoo too. The the uh is the thing. The uh yeah. syncopation is the thing that feels so close to the downbeat. Right. And There's even in Pino's that. playing, yeah, a lot of this. The, yeah. You know, one and up. There was a lot of how close could you get them? Yeah. Yeah. Like, where does this note actually belong? Right. Yeah. Is it a syncopation or is it on the beat? Yeah. It's so yeah. It's right next to the next mm. downbeat. Could you talk a little bit about what is changing when you go from straight to like your interpretation of Dilla 
is kick or kick and snare staying kind of like grid because there has to be some consistency yeah right is, like yeah. yeah what's sort of like where's the downbeat almost where's the where's the anchor point within that groove i mean it it's like the pulse hasn't changed so that's the anchor point i think probably the on beats haven't changed unless your two and four is going to be early or late or something like that so probably the on beats the, the bits that are in are still on the strong beats. on the original place yeah in their original position like on the grid is probably this amount of it but then you're adding in the and you can do whatever you want with a kick and pull it all over the place i was going to say the kick's all over the place in the, yeah in this example yes yeah rich your kick's all over the place kick yeah. all over, get it together, i know yeah it's good, isn't it? <laughs> Rich, when, when you play like Dilla Time and you're playing with a click, are you trying to adhere to the click in a different way than if you're playing straight funk? Kind of yes and no. It's it's difficult one that because the responsibility of playing to the click is the same and your 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 focus on the click is the same. Yeah. I think you have a more sort of languid you have more space around it and you could probably disrespect it a bit more <laughs> yeah. than in a straight thing where you just want it just to tick and in a consistent way. But I think just because this stuff is swung, it doesn't mean that there's inconsistency to it. I think to, for it to work, it needs to be consistent, like, mm. like a hip hop beat needs to be consistent, you know? So, yes. so it, it does still require quite a lot of attention to, you know, micro placement with the click. Could we hear a little of that? Could we get a little bit of click in playback and listen to you guys play to a click and just hear what the click, the, the click is the constant, right? The click is never changing. Yeah. Like how you guys would play around that because you were hearing a click in your ears, but the audience, right? We weren't hearing a yeah, click we're in not, playback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it yeah. would be so interesting to do a bit where we could actually hear what's happening and how you're interpreting the click. Mm. If you're used to playing with the click, how do you think about playing it in Dilla time? Sure. All right, yeah. cool, cool. There were moments there that were, that the click, I thought- It disappeared. I thought, oh, did Sharon yeah. stop the click, right? <laughs> so it's wild because the click was dropped. You were dropping your strong beats, like you said, and like I imagined you would, right on top yes. of that click. But then it's the things around, it's the syncopations that get the treatment. Yes. And I- Treatment, I love that. Well, right? To get the <laughs> treatment. It's the treatment. <laughs> yeah, it's a different treatment. <laughs> playing a straight groove. Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like sometimes I hear people thinking that the Dilla thing in their playing is just slowing down, right? Or just like, oh, we're gonna pull everything back. But that's right. not the case. No, well, that, that would be my number one um, advice to drummers trying to play this stuff it should that's the opposite of what you should do yeah that's when it doesn't work right like I, i've played with a lot of younger guys having to go at doing this and they're like oh it should feel like it's going backwards right you know the one thing that i need to pull back against is the most driving snare you've ever heard yes you know I mean? because it only works when that's on when those strong beats yeah. are on so that then you can <laughs> if everyone drags then <laughs> the whole thing's is lower and back what is yeah, it yeah. no it's not <laughs> slower it's the same tempo it's just it's just you'll only hear like a tiny little it's just gone and then it it's not going to sound any different whatsoever <laughs> right because if every yeah. if everybody just moves back the relative then it's the same <laughs> tempo, yeah, yeah. 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 And, uh, and and could you talk to a bit rob about like how you are playing the bass to a groove like this like is there something that you're thinking about um is there an approach that you take um i mean that example which is uh it's a track we used to play with ty an mc like a london mc that we toured with a lot who sadly is no longer with us. But this was like a big tune. It used to kick off when we played it. But it's that thing of just having an identity to the track, you know. And in this case, it was like the really snappy kick drum. And the bass is basically straight, but it's late as hell. Oh, <laughs> so yes. it's behind the beat. And I'm just playing. Yeah. 
There's a little bit of shuffle to it, but the main thing is it's just all it's, later it's in way time. Back, so. Yeah, yeah, and that's just yeah. propelling it forward, and that's that's why it works. And tonally, it, it makes a difference having a subby sound as well because it seems to disassociate itself tonally from the drums a little bit. So you don't mind. This is my perception of yeah. it. You don't mind hearing it kind of displaced. You know? Right. Mm. If I had like a super bright bass sound, it might be like, oh, you Or with a it. really harsh attack on it. Yeah, exactly. Be, yeah. It would sound like it's conflicting, yeah, it but yeah. Like... <laughs> <laughs> Almost like yeah. hearing hearing somebody's trunk rattle mm. as it goes by, right? Or like a club in the distance. I'd be happy with that sound. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's my sound. Could, could you guys demonstrate that with just like kick, snare, and the bass line? Just to hear, like to isolate your syncopation yeah, against it'll, the strong beats? Yeah, it'll sound pretty well, funny, it, actually. But. Yeah, because I think what we're saying is like we're, we're on sort of like different clocks. On yeah. This. Like our subdivisions are, are different. Yes. And I think when you're in that situation, it's good to understand each other's. And then also just to sort of like trust beyond that. Cause like when it really gets locked in, which, you know, we've played on some real big systems with Ty and like you say, it's really kicked off playing this tune. Mm. And when you get it in there, it's like, it just feels amazing. Cause it's like, you realize that there's more to music than just like the straightforward, like, yes, we must be at least on the same yeah. time signature subdivision, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Back. See, I love that. It's so cool. Yeah, it took, it took a lot of work to get that consistent. Yes. Actually. I think I can move it by varying the mounts, but you just, yeah, the other stuff really helps. To how did you work on in, that? How did you work on actually being able to move that? I guess mostly on the job, but just to, to be honest, I'm always just conscious of it. Hmm. Actually, yeah. hundred percent of the time, I'm very. Conscious of my placement and like where where could I put this next time around to make it feel even better? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. And in that example, I really hear what you're saying about like if that weren't consistent, if mm. the strong beats weren't consistent, this wouldn't yeah. work. No, not at all. Right, no. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. fun. It's so fun to be able to peel back the layers. It's like yeah. like you being able to do that is almost like having a mute on the on like the hi hat group on a DAW, you know what I mean? To, just to like hear yeah. how the uh, the bass syncopation is interacting with the strong beats. Yeah, it's, it's, inter it's interesting, back. yeah. It makes it more difficult that because you want all that stuff to just be bobbing along and then and then I'm doing this strange thing, pulling against it. When you strip it back, it's like, oh yeah, that is pretty weird. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> it sounds wicked, man. Like something I've also seen you do, Rob, as well, is that you use a lot of the E and the A and like some people watching might be thinking, why is he not going down to the D and the G, you know, when you're sort of like playing around? And right. obviously, yeah, just talk a little bit about that because I think it's a re obviously a, like a tonal consideration for you. And uh, not just in that track, I think. I never, it's not something yeah. I've ever really thought of, but... Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I mean... I'm, like, I'm are you favouring that thicker tone of the E and the A and that's why you're not specifically just playing so. over? I tend to be up the neck, like I'd rather play a B flat there, to be honest. Yeah than there because it, you get that. It, it starts getting a bit yeah which is yeah. cool for some things you know if i wanted a tighter sound then i guess i'd play there but usually i'm after a warmer yeah yeah and you're doing a bunch of like left hand muting there as well aren't you yeah 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 i just can control the length of the strong the string by how much <laughs> yeah how much yeah. i use the the uh soft bits there yes so funny, like I spent years working on my technique and now I basically play with one finger. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you use a bunch of vibrato as well when you're doing yeah. that line as well, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Trying to get that real sine wave synth sound. Again, yeah, it's a real key part of the sound. You know, yeah. not going for BB King so much, but right. <laughs> but like the oscillators rubbing against yeah. one another. Yeah, it'd be of. great if I could make it go below pitch as well. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. but I guess I found a way of doing that.
We should just talk about the click at the end when the, as it gets faster, it's hilarious. Like the oh click, yeah, the click track's hilarious. Yeah. What happens to the click as it gets faster? It just feels funny. It just keeps going. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's such a fun moment because there's a modulation, so mm. it's getting higher, right, and faster. <laughs> there's this. We're like, oh, where are we going? And there's this feeling, right? This yeah. is a, it's a Jordan Rakai track. This called Toko, right? So, just to fill in the blanks of when when we wrote this it was just funny and it, i think it's a good reminder even to myself we we got to the end and it was like got an idea mm. but then it was sort of already dismissed it because it was sort of ridiculous it was a ridiculous idea you know yeah i remember we sort of looked at each other with a bit of there was a bit of mischief in it and it's like <laughs> yeah. why don't we just do it yeah. you know and i'm glad we did and you know we basically just like put the click so it just suddenly on the one it's just it's just faster yes and then it goes around four times and it's just faster and of course to to play that is ridiculous it's but actually it's like, insanely difficult to play on the bass it's really because it starts off there in e <laughs> and you got that i mean Ooh. if you can think of a better way to do this uh at least you've got an open e <laughs> yeah. next time you don't have the open e anymore so you go <laughs> uh, honestly, I can't think of a it better way mental, to play it. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's like a dare gone it's wrong. Really hot. It? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It probably was great on the road. It's really easy to play. Yeah, yeah, in, yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> when you guys are playing like odd time stuff like that, uh, my assumption is that you're not counting it and you're feeling it in sort of like larger groupings of time. Can you yeah. talk about that for a bit? Yeah, no numbers, basically. No numbers. Really? Absolutely not. No. I mean, that's my whole thing. I'm always, yeah, yeah. it's my rant really about like, I feel like if something is complicated in terms of numbers, then as a drummer, as a musician, it's like, it's for us to just absorb all of that. And then when it, 
you know, when it comes out, it's just music. I don't feel like you want to watch me counting, you know. Right. Yeah. So I, d I think for me, it's just like it's about absorbing it. You know, with making this track with Jordan, it was about sort of like, I don't know, something your mum could listen to or something like something you could. I mean, I've seen people dance to this. <laughs> Rob didn't look convinced. I'm just pointing out. <laughs> but he didn't what, look convinced. What I mean is this. You're not presenting it in a way that's like that's emphasizing it being in a weird time signature or anything like that. There's not, nothing over the top about or signposting the fact that it's difficult yes. to play. It doesn't have that wink of yes. like, yes. it's an odd time signature. Yes. Right. Yeah. So it's sort of trying to just sort of execute it in a way that's like still kind of slick and cool and like, I like this tune. It's still got a soulful vibe to it. But, you know, without doing that, basically. So it's, yeah. it's. Again, I think it's just, it gives it an identity, doesn't it? Because yeah. there's yeah. nothing that sounds like that. Yes. The way that it lilts and like all the combination of all the elements is just. Yeah. I mean, the thing about the numbers is they're, they, they're essential, you know, if you're, when you're learning it and you're working it out, of course, you need to un understand where it's coming from. So yeah. I'm not like saying never, <laughs> never use numbers. Right. They're like the basis of rhythm, aren't they? You know, they're really, yeah. but I'm like, I'm a fan. A fan of numbers, but oh. it's, there's the the point is, you know, when you're in it, it's nice to think of it in a larger scale. I have this thing where I sort of think of each bar as being an amount of time long, you know, that I can feel. Yeah. So it's almost like you're feeling a longer pulse. You know, I know that the bar is about 1.2 seconds long, and it, every time it comes around, it feels like the right place oh, to right. land on the front again. So instead of so I want to do the, do the you're thinking it like. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then there's a long one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so ah, you could think so like, within that, how many how many threes are there? It's four threes, so one, two. It's three bars three, of six. Four. Then it's a bar of three, and then it's three a bar bars of six. One. So can you clap that for us then? What? But it's just one, yeah. two, three, four, five, six. Two, two, three, four, oh, five, so yeah, six. Yeah, yeah. Three, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. One. That's the top. Yeah. Got yeah. It. So you could say three sixes and a seven. So yeah, like yeah. one of them's a little bit longer, but yeah, I can sort of work with that <laughs> yeah and you're just feeling the downbeats is yeah. like the ones almost yeah, so the trying big to simplify it, yeah, yeah yeah and then i can concentrate on other stuff so you're not feeling like metric time you're feeling actual time yeah <laughs> the length of time yeah. passing yeah yeah exactly yeah. yeah which is kind of what normal feeling of pulses are just on yeah. a different scale isn't it yeah we're not all yeah. counting to four right in standard yeah. grooves we're when you, feeling when you play your semi-grade you know how to make them equally spaced yes. you know it's yeah. just on a slightly different scale well, thank you all for that for that breakdown because you know I'm over here going one two three four five six one two three four five six you know and then trying to get into that four one two three four right I mean is there some level of needing to do that in the beginning yeah before you actually Absolutely, can just yeah, feel yeah. it yeah yeah I think so yeah yeah, yeah. definitely yeah. well I was really uh, I was really relieved then when it <laughs> went into the section of four but then you couldn't let it stay right <laughs> then then it kept getting faster right. So great. I mean, the the difference between those two things is really cool. Can you talk to us a little bit about about how you're approaching this baseline? And I mean, I know you played that moment at the end, but in the beginning, are you using anything on the board for this, or is it just no. straight up hands? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. In a way, I would like to have a precision or something for this, but I think of it as just actually synth bass on the record, isn't it? But yeah. we played this live a lot, and I guess I just wanted to. Just works really nice, muted and. Are you doing anything on a jazz bass to get that P bass vibe? Yeah, just rolling this pickup back a little bit. Yeah. Like, uh, thirty percent back or something. To be honest, from that point, I never noticed a lot of difference right. to you. Like, it's in that first ten percent, yeah, kind of, right? Yeah. So you back it off, then it's a bit more precision. -y. And I'm just want to be quite insistent with it. I think if I depart too much from it, apart from it getting a bit difficult, yes. If I do. It kind of loses the rolling thing. So, right. Yeah, I'm just trying to keep it pretty simple. And then are you turning your tone knob back as well? It's, uh, it's actually, it's on, I'm going to say, 40% tone. 100% sounds like this. And zero. Got it, yeah, tone. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I might sometimes play that with my thumb as well. Have you got flats on it? No. They're rounds, yeah? They're actually pretty bright. Rounds, yeah. You're just controlling the level of brightness mm. with the tone control and sometimes and with the, the muting, hand. yeah. And I think this really helps as well. I mean, it's pretty subtle, but if I take the bass rig off, it's definitely 
definitely sounds more like a DI bass with some of the and then enter, this just sort of thickens it up. Yes. Yeah. Sounds good. You were playing fifths there. Like I've, I've noticed when I watch you play, you, lot, you play a lot of double stops, right? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, can you just talk about that for a minute? Because I think that you use them so much in your bass lines that mm. I think it'd be, a, it'll be a, yeah, it'd be an own goal if we don't get you to talk about it. Yeah. Actually, yeah, I've done, I've done a little video on this for, with, my, with my own patron thing, but just I think uh, a lot of bassists think when they think of double stops, they, they either do that yeah. or, you know, the old... Yeah, the flat fives. You know, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I just wanted to open that out a bit and think, well, it doesn't have to be that at all. I quite like doing the thing with, if you put a bit, yeah. a bit of vibrato on with a fifth, it just sounds like, again, trying to get them to move the same amount. Sounds quite synthy. Or I might do like, seconds are really nice sometimes. You know, and sometimes thinking about two parts moving independently is a, is a good approach to this as well. You know, instead of so you're just imagining two melodies instead of yes. instead of just thinking, oh, I'm I'm making an interval. Yeah. Third, yeah. I noticed too when you're playing those fifths, especially kind of maybe up high, rooting on the E string, or down mm. low, rooting on the A string. Mm. It sounds lower. It's almost it almost gives you this feeling of like a octave pedal mm. on or something. There's like yeah. a there's like a low like when you play a D and an A together. Yeah. It's like yeah. that yeah. sounds almost like there's a low D in the mix. Yeah, it's like there's a pressure. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> yeah. being contributed to the mix. Yeah, yeah, it's a really fun thing that you can do that doesn't require the board, right? Just yeah. with hands. And also where you pick that can make a really big difference. So if it if doing that would really fill out the mix too much and make it too muddy, you can always like uh, you, you pick there and all that yeah, yeah. mud goes away yes. actually. So you can control almost control the amount of mud in your It's like a filter. <laughs> your double stops. That's fine, right? Yeah. That's too much. Right. That's fine. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please stay seated as we prepare for the String Change Challenge. Okay, Rich and Rob, are you ready <laughs> for the bass string challenge? Yep. You've got to put a brand new set of strings that are still in the pack on this bass. You are under the gun with the clock. We're gonna be we're gonna be counting you down. You gotta do it as fast as you possibly can. Now look, these strings have to be on the bass. They don't have to be up to pitch, but they have to have some tension. We gotta get a set of strings on this bass. I'm going for a sheer time, right? I might not even use these. Oh, well, li <laughs> that listen, is, that oh. is the technique <laughs> is up to you. We've seen you function so well together as a rhythm section. Now, <laughs> yeah. we're gonna have to see you function. <laughs> String yes. changing. As however, a tech however, duo. However long this takes, it will be the quickest that I've ever strung a bass. <laughs> 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 You're winning yet before you yeah. start, yeah. <laughs> Uh, in addition to this, we're going to try to distract you with trivia. Are you ready? Yep. Sharon, All right. calm down. <clears throat> uh, we go on go. So, three, two, one, go. And they're oh, off. Go on. <laughs> and they're off. Shall I look up the answers to their questions? Do that. Open it. <laughs> <laughs> you two are a formidable bass and drums duo. Name two bands comprised of just Bass and drums. Two bands. bands. Just from uh, the, yes. the black white stripe. <laughs> well, that would be a guitar and drums. Oh shit. Okay, um, Rich, we've got to read the chart. There's a chart for what color goes where. But he threw the chart over there. <laughs> Don't get, Don't get the chart. Um, bass and drums. Here's the chart. Uh, Why do you oh, need man. a chart? Help me. Bass and drums. The bands that are bass and drums. There sure are. Just bass and drums. I'm struggling. <laughs> I got one. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, it's not coming to We're going to move on. I would have gold. accepted Blood. Royal Blood. Royal Blood. Death from Above 1979. Oh, Lightning Bolt. There are many others. According to the Beastie Boys, you guys, <laughs> you will be incredibly sleep deprived until you reach this East Coast American city. Rich? 
<laughs> uh, no I'll sleep. Like, no sleep till. Oh, Cincinnati. <laughs> no sleep till Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> In Brooklyn. It hey. is Brooklyn. Oh, well God, done. Well oh, done, God. fellas. Yeah. PB and J or beans and toast? Beans on toast. I mean, I know what I'm going to say. He's such an Englishman. What? You are. Was that a question? Yeah. Yes. Beans on toast or PB and J? Oh, beans on toast. Okay. I'll go with I'll go with him for this occasion. Beans yeah. on toast. Yeah, yeah. You're both incorrect. <laughs> PB and J is <laughs> PB and J is so delicious. <laughs> it's so delicious. Don't let me distract you guys. You're doing well. Ah, Keep going. The, Keep going. The gradation on this is absolutely. <laughs> much the slowest one I've ever used. Ian, how many strings we got on? How many strings do we have on? Right now, currently, we have one Look at the string. Chart. The thread chart. him, Rich. Thread him. Should Two I minutes. be finding this therapeutic? This so <laughs> What's the next question? <laughs> the next question. True or false? First green. Rob's signature Wilcock bass was named the Malarkey due to his wife wanting to retain her maiden name. <laughs> Well, Is that for me? Yeah. I love that so much. Oh man, I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. The modern electric bass was invented in what year? You're asking me. Seriously. <laughs> I'm asking you. Care to, care to take a swing at it? 1952. So close. So close. Rich. <laughs> <laughs> Fifty uh, second is black, by the way. Thanks. Um, hurry up, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> it's incredibly difficult. Uh, it's nineteen forty. That's no, that's a bad no, time. I was incredibly close. <laughs> With 52. What did you say? Fifty two. Yeah. Nineteen fifty. Go in the middle. Fifty one. Correct. Oh, we got <laughs> Correct. We got it. See, I gave it. it to him. That's what a good team we are. Yeah. <laughs> Detroit, Michigan, famous for producer Jay Dilla, was also famous for Motown Records, where Studio A was called the Snake Pit. Why on earth was it called the Snake Pit? This is so embarrassing. I should know. Snake Pit? I don't know, was it like... Do we need the chart anymore? I sort of... <laughs> Dump the chart. Dump the chart. We're done, we're done with it. Yeah. We don't need okay. the chart. <laughs> um, I don't know, was it just like a terrifying hire and fire situation? That's what I thought too. That's right. what I thought. Yeah. Uh, but actually, it was because they used to hang microphones from the ceiling. And when they would take the mics off, the wires would continue to hang. Looked like snakes. Oh. What time are we on, Sharon? Oh. We're on 4.05. When a young Stevie Wonder used to record in Detroit at Motown Records, <laughs> what was his favorite choice from the candy vending machine? Wow. Um. I'm going to give it to you. Baby Ruth. Okay. Baby Ruth. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> on the classic album Voodoo, D'Angelo oh, told Questlove he wanted his drums to sound like they were A, jazzy, B, funky, or C, drunk. 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 Yeah. Ah! <laughs> hey, and with that, <laughs> we have four strings on a bass. Smashed it. We have them roughly in tune. <laughs> yeah. Sharon, what's the time? 434. Yeah. Smashed it. Yeah. Smashed it. Yeah. yeah. Top, oh. of, top of the leaderboard, Rich. Like you did, you Rob tried that, but I think it was down to Rich. <laughs> but you didn't tell me what, how to help. I actually had like a Formula One drill over here just to go <laughs> zzz, 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 but you didn't tell me. Did everyone me, else you know? read the chart and put them on the right? Strings. Mate, we've had we've had them in the yeah. Lord and everything. I think that yeah, you know that you know that. Yeah. But I loved I love that you were concerned about that. <laughs> Amazing, getting them on the right way. Yes, round of applause. Really round of applause. <laughs> well done, guys. <laughs> Ladies and gents, quick shout: Rich Spaven, <laughs> Rob Malarkey. Where can they find you guys if they want to come and harass you online? I know you've both got Patreons and websites and all those shenanigans. My Patreon's a good place to do that. Is it a good place yeah. to do that? Yeah. yeah. Go give Rich money. Rob, yeah, do you yeah, take pounds and dollars? <laughs> and love. We take like money and love on there, yeah. Money and love. Yeah. And thanks to Ian Allison, Sharon Reynolds, Lydia Reynolds, oh, everybody behind Dan, and massive shout out to Nathan of Fiction Studios here. Take it easy. We'll see you in a bit. Bye. Yeah. Just cuddle each other very tenderly. <laughs> yeah, that would do. All right, yeah.